Uh, I remember a couple of years ago, we were in Hiroshima, Japan, and we were climbing a steep slope to get to a temple. And as we were doing that, a young woman stepped forward and she said, Lama, Dalai Lama, I need to talk to you. And of course, the bodyguards quickly spirited her away. And uh, His Holiness went up to the temple and we were sitting there quietly for a few minutes. And as we were sitting there, we could hear her shouting outside. And as soon as His Holiness came out of the temple, to my amazement, he called his security to him and he asked them to bring her right next to him. And he just cupped her face in his hand uh, and looked deeply into her eyes and more or less said, I'm your friend, you have nothing to worry about. We have much more in common than apart. And of course it was astonishing to see that because most of us when faced with hecklers run in the opposite direction. But I think beyond that, as with so much he does, it really spoke for the larger things he believes in, which is face-to-face -face contact, dialogue, looking for common ground. Uh, and the last thing I'll say, because we will be speaking about exile today, uh, and this marks the 50th year of uh, His Holiness and many Tibetans' lives in exile, uh, is that recently when I was researching my book on His Holiness, I found that the very first words he delivered when he set foot in exile was, were, now we are free. Again, extraordinary words. To us, it seems he's lost his country, he's lost his immediate contact with his people, uh, he's lost his seeming destiny, but instantly, he's seeing loss as opportunity. He's seeing it from a wider perspective and realizing that in exile, he could do many things that might have been hard to do in old Tibet. He can give women uh, new rights. He can bring science into his monk's curriculum. Uh, he can liberate uh, Tibet from its centuries old isolation. And I think most important, he can bring his people democracy for the first time in their history. Uh, one reason why after 50 years in exile, the economist, uh, not the most gushing of magazines, uh, calls uh, the Tibetan refugee community far and away the most successful on the planet. Uh, all of you know that Mary Robinson was president of Ireland from 1990 to 1997, and immediately after that uh, served as the second ever UN High Commissioner for Human Rights. And as president of her country, the first female president, she really oversaw its transformation, inward and outward. Uh, people now think back on the Robinson years, as they're called, uh, as a golden age. Uh, and uh, at one point, if you can believe it, she enjoyed 93% popularity ratings. Uh, more substantial than that, though, uh, as president of Ireland, she was the first head of state to go to Somalia during its crisis in 1992. She was the first head of state to go to Rwanda after its catastrophe in 1997. And I think she was already beginning to frame this new vision of rights that she took deeper and made much more global once she was at the United Nations, which is to speak for the rights of children. Uh, the rights of women, the rights of victims of torture, the rights of uh, victims of racial discrimination, and to remind us that rights are not just something political and civic, but uh, economic and, and social, that it's not just a matter of freedom of speech and freedom of belief, but freedom from fear and freedom from need. Uh, as many of you know, she's been deeply concerned with the Tibetan issue since the days when she was in the Senate of Ireland, uh, she became the first UN High Commissioner to visit Tibet in 1998. And while she was president, I think she showed what to me seems characteristic fearlessness and resolve by uh, meeting His Holiness when he came to Ireland, even though most of the people around her were telling her it was imprudent in terms of her country's trade relations with Beijing. Uh, she's now leading Realizing Rights, the Ethical Globalization Initiative, and when you hear those words, and when you remember that His Holiness says he travels around the world to share global ethics, you can see one of the many things that our two inspirations uh, have in common. Uh, I think they've always been the champions of the dispossessed, the impoverished, and the voiceless, and have always worked just as Seamus Heaney uh, so beautifully wrote to make hope and history rhyme. Um, there are so many things we could talk about with them today, but we thought it would be most useful to focus our discussion and at least to begin with exile and then radiate out from there because this is the age of the dispossessed person. By some counts, 200 million people in the world live outside their countries. Uh, my aim is to be as silent as possible uh, and uh, I apologize in advance if I ask the questions you wish were not being asked, but uh, as you heard, you have a chance to submit questions of your own. So I will go over there and start the dialogue, but I just want to thank President Robinson and Your Holiness so much for sharing your time with us today.
Um, Your Holiness, I know you don't like to dwell on the past, because the past is past, but could you tell us how you began thinking when you arrived in India in 1959, knowing you had to reconstruct your culture? What were your priorities, and what were your inspirations, or what precedents did you look to as you began to... To do it? No. No. Yes, I think in 1956, uh, then not as a refugee, but uh, I think uh, quite high sort of food, uh, no, quite high sort of position <laughs> in the government of people from China. So uh, came to India as a guest of Indian government. So during that period, uh, I met, uh, of course, Indian leaders, and then many Gandhians, freedom fighters. So then actually, at that time, there is opportunity to remain in India, and a lot of talks also it took place. But finally, mainly, Pandit Nehru's sort of advice, and I returned, uh, beginning of 57. So when 59 crisis is happened, or although I did my, my best effort, you see, to, sorry, you see, to cool down the situation, but fail. Then, when we reach Indian border, firstly, the people who received me at the border, uh, some of my old friends, one Indian official who was posted in Lhasa, and also some, uh, some other officials I already know, 1956. So therefore, when I reach border, I feel something like reunion. Mm. That's one, I think, consolation, consolation. Ray. <laughs> consolation. <laughs> then, the immediate our task is look after the refugee. Uh, after me, uh, several thousand follow. Uh, but then our main task is for preservation of Tibetan culture. And the way to preserve our culture with modern education. So we emphasis at most important of modern education. So within one year, we established first Tibetan school in Mussoorie. 